Hey everyone, my name is Colt. Thanks for watching. So today we're talking about CSS animations. In particular, we're talking about the only two CSS properties you should animate with a big star next to it if you really care about performance. The takeaway from this video should not be that there are only two properties you should use for every animation you do from here on out until the day you die. We do all die, of course. Instead, my point is that there are two properties that are more efficient to use when you build your animations. They lead to less janky animations, uh, just better performance, and you should try and use them whenever possible. So you start building something, you need an animation, start with these two properties. It's not a hard rule. Of course, you can make animations using whatever you want. A lot of the time, even most of the time, I would say, it will look fine. However, there are some situations where it does matter, and I'll go into some of them in this video. So it's not a hard rule, as I mentioned, but I did reach out to a couple of my friends, two out of my two friends, both of whom are developers in San Francisco, and both of them told me that their company's policy is that they can only use these two properties when they're adding animations to their production site. So what are these properties? I know there's going to be a bunch of comments about how I don't mention the properties until 30 minutes into the 10 minute video. I apologize. Here they are. The first one, our good friend, opacity. Very useful right? We can change the opacity of something, make it more translucent or transparent, hide it entirely, or at least hide it visually. Also, I should note, opacity is fully supported across all the major browsers. The other property is the very versatile transform. Transform lets us rotate, scale, translate, meaning move something up or down or left or right. It's really, really useful. If we click through some of these, there we're moving something, we can scale, we can rotate, skew, we can do more than one thing at once. So we can use it in all sorts of ways. The support for transform is pretty solid across the board now with the exception of Opera Mini. Do with that what you will. But there is an important distinction between the 2D transforms like rotate, scale, and translate, and then the 3D transforms, which includes things like perspective. Now these aren't as commonly used uh, you can do a whole bunch with the 2D animations or 2D transforms, but you can see the 3D transforms are a little bit more spotty. So partial support in IE11 and IE Mobile, but overall transform is pretty much there in every browser. Those two properties on their own can be combined to make a whole bunch of interesting things. Here's an example. Now this is actually done with a JavaScript animation library, but if we look at the properties that are animated, we have translate X, translate Y, rotate, those are coming from transform. Here's another thing made with only transform. One more, this one's pretty crazy. It does have some JavaScript, but the only properties that are being animated, translate X, translate Y, scale, that's all coming from transform. Just a couple more, something like this. You can get very creative with only opacity and transform. So now the question is, why those two? Why are those two better than all the other properties? To understand that, we have to talk about how browser rendering works. Obviously, it's a very complicated process, but here's a simple breakdown of the key pieces. Typically, something will trigger an animation. Let's say it's JavaScript. There's a click event that's fired, and that starts the animation. So that's the first piece. After that, styles are calculated, or often recalculated. The browser needs to figure out which styles apply to which elements based off of the selectors. It may need to calculate specificity, figure out if there's a conflict, which selector wins out. And then we move on to layout. So this is when the browser is calculating where elements go, how much space they take up, and often moving or animating the margin, for example, will affect not just the element itself, but things that come after it in the layout. So you might be moving multiple things around just by animating one element. Next up is painting. So this is when the browser fills in, starts to color in the pixels, puts the visual information in the screen or on the screen. Uh, and this is often done across multiple layers. And the last piece is compositing. This is when the browser takes those multiple layers and combines them and draws them. Sometimes those layers overlap. Sometimes there's some opacity, translucency to those layers, and the browser handles that in the composite phase. To quickly illustrate what I'm talking about, here is the world's simplest HTML page. We have an H1 and a single selector to turn H1's purple, great color. If you come over here, you can see the result of all that hard work. And if I go to the performance tab in Chrome, I'm going to profile, well, I'm gonna reload the page and profile everything that happens along the way. So we'll see all the little events, the different phases we talked about, doesn't take very long. 
I'm gonna have to zoom in, but you'll see that there are some different colored blocks. The yellowy orange ones correspond to JavaScript. So you can see very early on, there was a request sent and then we got a response back. Then there's some JavaScript stuff, keep going. This is all a matter of what, 10, 20 milliseconds so far in between these different events. Then we get to parse HTML. Here is the first calculation of style. So calculating style, and then after that, we move on to layout. So it's figuring out what goes where, and we're gonna have to move a bit more. There's a big gap here. There we go. There's other stuff happening, some JavaScript, but eventually we hit paint and then composite. So those different phases are all present, even without the animation. That just happens when a page loads. But when we animate things, when we start changing those properties or adding properties halfway through or on click or something, then we potentially have to go through all of these phases again. But that's not always the case. Only some properties trigger certain pieces of this process. So how do you know which operations a CSS property will trigger? You can use the dev tools, which I'll show you, but we can also look it up. There are a couple resources online. Here we can see different properties like width and its invasiveness it affects the layout and onwards. So we have to recalculate the layout or the browser does it for us. Something like opacity, doesn't do layout, doesn't do paint, skips right to composite. There's another very popular website called CSS Triggers and it shows the same information in a more mm, exciting format, <laughs> less Google Docy, and also it breaks it down by different browser engine. So let's take something like width. If we animate the width of an element, we have to start all over again with layout. Then we have to repaint and then composite at the very end. Let's compare that to something like background. So background color. Layout is not impacted, paint and composite are. And then finally, opacity and transform, two of the only properties that skip layout, they skip painting, they work in composite layers. So they are much, much more efficient. So it's time to prove it. Let's look at some code. Here's a very simple demo I built. Let's look at the top two boxes. Both of them look identical. Both of them are going to animate their size. They're going to stretch across the screen. The first one uses width. The second one uses transform. So I'll just show you. They look the same. They end up at the same place, the same size. It takes the same amount of time. If we do them together, well, that was a terrible job. There we go. Hit the buttons at the same time. They look good. They look similar. But one of them is animated with transform scale X five times. The other one with 500 pixels. The, the original width is 100. Okay, so let's now profile them using Chrome. Performance. So I'm gonna hit the record button and press one for the first animation with width. When it finishes, I'll do the second one with transform. Here we go. First one, second one. Stop. And let's see what we get. So you can see frame rate is showing up here. That's what this green stuff is. Both of them are green. They look decent. And we don't have enough going on, honestly, for it to impact the frame rate. But if we look in this main section here, here's the first animation when we did width. First of all, just look at how much more cluttered it is. Look at all this stuff going on. Let's pick a random, I don't know how many milliseconds, whatever this window is, we're looking at 7.1 milliseconds of rendering, 4.7 milliseconds of painting. It's not very, it's not a lot. But now let's scroll over to the middle of our other animation. We have no painting, 0.2 milliseconds of scripting. So it's a huge difference. And if we zoom in again, you can see on our first animation with width, we have recalculating style, layout, we have paint, and composite layers. And if we compare that to what we had with the second animation, these dev tools can be annoying to navigate. First of all, we have way fewer things going on. You will see somewhere in here, it will calculate styles. It will do a layout at some point. As you can see here, there is layout. We do have some painting going on, but then if we compare the rest of it, it's basically like nothing is happening for this entire one second animation when you compare it to what we have over here. So it's very similar for animating background. Although background does not affect layout, it does affect paint. So if we refresh, I go through this one more time. This time, I'm gonna trigger the animated background and then the animated opacity. So what I've done here is replicated changing a background color, 
by having two divs stacked on top of one another, and the first one on top is fading out. The opacity is being animated to reveal the underlying div. So they look the same, but one is using background, the other is animated using opacity. Okay, so let's start a recording. I'll trigger the first one, and now the second one. And same story. So if we zoom in more on the first animation, you'll see that we don't have recalculating layout. We have recalculate style, but we don't have layout. We just have paint and composite over and over and over. Paint, composite. Now if we compare that once again, it's pretty much empty over here. Nothing going on for the most part over in this animation, which we used opacity for. So hopefully this makes it clear why you should care why there is a fundamental difference. Opacity and transform don't trigger layout. They don't trigger a repaint. They are way, way faster. Okay, so that's one element that we're animating. Let's try animating like a couple thousand elements. So as I've already mentioned, a lot of the time it doesn't really matter. It's important that you understand the difference and that there is a difference. But if you're just adding like a hover effect to the title or an H1 on your website, it's not really a big deal. But in this example, which I've adapted from a MDN example, I've added like 10, maybe 100 times more elements than they used in their example. We have a bunch of these different colored elements that are going to be animated to bounce across the screen sort of in odd ways. The first version is animated with margin. The second one is with transform. Remember that margin is going to impact the layout of things. We have to repaint, composite, and then we have transform, which skips most of that. So just notice what happens. This is that beautiful animation when we use margin. It's very, very janky, very just glitchy and hard to watch. Terrible frame rate. Now we switch to transform. And look at that. Very, very smooth. It's still probably not a perfect 60 frames per second, uh, but also why would you ever need, I don't know, like over a thousand, maybe three or four thousand moving blocks like I have here? You probably won't. But I hope this makes it clear. Margin, let's go back to it. Oof, it feels like my computer is already overheating just from playing this for a few seconds. All right, one more example. I didn't write this one. It's coming from Paul Irish, one of his blog posts. Very good blog post on this topic. We have a MacBook or some sort of laptop that's built with CSS actually. So it's not just one element moving around. It's quite a few being moved around using top and left. So using position and, and absolute position to move it around. So that is a layout affecting property. So if I add just 10 more MacBooks, first of all, it looks horrible. My computer's not happy, but you can see these weird glitchy areas, not to mention the frame rate, which is just horrendous. Let's compare that to the same thing done with translate. I can add 10 more. I can add a whole bunch more. We don't run into that same problem. I can keep going. It's gonna look bad just because there's so much going on, but I don't have that same issue. So it's always a good idea to keep performance in mind, to turn to transform and opacity before you turn to any other properties. And at the end of the day, sometimes it just looks better too, even if you're just animating one or two items. So here's one last demo I built. We have two CSS loaders. I slowed them way down. Usually they'd be moving much faster, but it's easier to see what's happening. So the first one is animated using height and width. We go from 10 pixels to 30, back to 10. And then the other one is done with scale, which is part of transform. If we zoom in, you can tell without the dev tools, without having to get out a slow motion camera, this looks way worse. It's so jagged, the way that it's actually scaling is not smooth. Now, if we compare that to transform, the same size, we're going from whatever it was, 10 pixels to 30 pixels or whatever that ratio was, it's so much smoother. And I'll probably throw in some slow motion taken with my bad iPhone slow-mo camera. We'll see if it looks okay. You'll be able to tell an even bigger difference. All right, so that's most of what I have to say on this topic. Remember, it's not a hard rule, but it's best to turn to opacity and to transform before you use any other properties for your animations. Those two, opacity and transform, will have the least impact possible on the critical rendering path compared to things like width or background. They are relatively lightweight. And you can honestly do a whole bunch of stuff, especially with transform. It's pretty powerful.
All right, that's it. So if you enjoyed that video, please consider subscribing, turning on notifications if you want to be part of the polls that I send out every week to figure out what to teach. If you're interested, you can find links to my full-length courses in my YouTube bio, as well as the description for this video. I'll leave you with a video of my cat standing up. Hey, Blue. Okay. Can you stand up? Say thank you to our subscribers. Oh, T-Rex cat there. There you go.